Good evening. Welcome to the special lecture series 2 organized by the Department of English, Katwa College. Today, we have with us Dr. Omshuman Mukhopadhyay. Dr. Omshuman Mukhopadhyay pursued his master's in English from Calcutta University, a gold medalist. His doctoral thesis is on Edward Bond, a contemporary British playwright. He has presented papers at several national and international seminars and published critical essays in journals and edited volumes. One of his writings is published in the prestigious Calcutta Review Journal. His areas of interest are British drama, cultural uh, cultural studies, etc. He is now the head of the Department of English in Profullo Chandro College and is associated with Sri Shikshayatan College, Kolkata as a guest faculty in postgraduate section of the Department of English for more than seven years now. Over to Dr. Omshuman Mukhopadhyay. He will be speaking on of rage and violence in Osborne's Look Back in Anger. Dr. Omshuman Mukhopadhyay, over to you. Good evening, all. Uh, I'm audible, I guess, right? Yes. Okay. Good evening, all. Uh, thank you, Indrani, for this uh, very crisp and precise introduction. And I'm very happy that I didn't have to wait long to speak because I uh, am not a very uh, great achiever. I haven't written a lot. I haven't done academically a lot. So uh, my bio note and introduction is short. So you see, one doesn't have to spend a lot of time and words in order to introduce me. And no, on a serious note, I sincerely thank Indrani, Professor Indrani Ray of Katwa College, the Department of English, and Professor Dulal Sharkar and Professor Onindo Bandopadhyay, who are the esteemed professors of the Department of the College, for inviting me to deliver a, a, a talk and be a part of this web lecture series that they're organizing very successfully indeed for quite some time now. Now, Indrani approached me uh, to uh, deliver a lecture on something uh, or a particular text or maybe a topic which she wanted uh, it to be pertaining to the syllabus. That is, the students are to be addressed primarily. Um, I, you know, when I, when I um, sort of, you know, decided that I was going to talk about a uh, uh, text, particular text from the syllabus, I sort of, you know, spontaneously chose Osborne's Look Back in Anger for the fact, simple fact that uh, the, the text is very dear to me. And when I was a student uh, in my undergraduate, uh, you know, days, I actually uh, wrote a paper and presented it in uh, or at a particular student seminar organized by our college in collaboration with uh, the students of Jadupur University. This uh, topic is different, obviously, that was on a different issue, but uh, I think uh, this particular text is uh, uh, one which is very close to me. I was uh, just to share a very brief anecdote before I you know, begin my serious discussion, for serious lecture, just to tell you or share with you how dear the text is uh, you know, uh, to me. There was this thing that we had to answer, reference to the context, probably you do also have to answer this particular question, this pattern, right? Reference to the context where there are a couple of lines quoted from a text and you have to locate it and say something. I remember that in our examination, uh, thankfully it was a college examination and not a university examination. Two lines were quoted from George Barnett Shaw's Arms and the Man we had in our syllabus. We also had look back in anger in our syllabus. I conveniently, uh, you know, identified those two lines from look back in anger. Actually, they were from uh, Bernard Shaw's Arms and the Man. And I explained it so beautifully mm -hmm. that when the, uh, you know, professor returned us my script with a big zero there, she said, my God, Ong Shuman, you have written such a lovely answer to a question which was not even asked. So this is, uh, you know, my love for look back in anger, you can say. So uh, the thing is that, as Indrani told me, that here the audience is going to be uh, primarily the students. 
uh, uh, but at the same time, I do know that some of my colleagues are also there. So I need to strike a kind of a find a golden mean. Go you know, it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult to find that kind of golden mean. Cannot be too esoteric, uh, cannot be too simplistic or simplistic rather. So it's it's very difficult. But then I'll try my best. And it is also uh, difficult to speak on violence, right? Because, you know, it reason for reasons more than one. Um, its presence is seen in various degrees in all forms of human society and among diverse people. It's pre pre specifically speaking, it is ubiquitous, right? Deep down, we are perhaps extremely insecure about our survival, about our existence in this world, for we feel that we are being betrayed, exploited, deprived of our agency, um, marginalized, challenged, harmed, and hurt for various reasons. We do feel that way because the society that we live in it doesn't really treat us uh, well always. So in the context of such treatments meted out to us or situations that we are sort of you know, thrust into, we have to deal with an overwhelming, you know, cross currents of, of emotions, of, of sadness, of anxiety, depression, rage, and even aggression or violence. Uh, let me just do this, uh, you know, the trickiest part first that is presenting my, um, you know, PowerPoint presentation first. Let me just do this, uh, see whether I can do it without much. I guess it's not there as yet. The trickiest part of it is there. Wait a bit. Right. Indrania, I'm doing it right, probably. You can all see that yes. one yes will do. You can see that, right? Yes, yes. Oh, thank God. Right. So uh, this is the topic that I'm going to uh, uh, you know, speak on, as you all uh, know, because Indrani has already told that, right? So I have already said to you how difficult it is to talk about violence and in this society, which really doesn't, uh, you know, treat us always so well. And the society that we live in is often instrumental in inculcating in us a kind of insanity, which is a consequence of the irrationality that this society also fosters. Let me go to the second uh, slide. Yes. Um, you know, the society fosters irrationality and aggression or violence then becomes our attempts at coping with this irrationality or that irrationality and an expression of that madness. Now, as you can see, this slide, I couldn't really accommodate it because I couldn't really, you know, minimize a little uh, the, 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 you know, the picture that I have got from the same society. It's a seminal text by uh, Eric Fromm. Um, a Freudo Marxist thinker. And uh, the chart actually shows uh, the countries, the names of the countries on one hand, like on the left, you can see the countries. And on the right, it's like it's the destructive acts, homicide and suicide combined. There is no homicide, there is no suicide in Look Back in Anger. But why this is relevant, I will perhaps refer to this by and by. And, you know, this is actually whose annual epidemiological and vital statistics, the, the data um, was received from 1939 to 46. And the chart actually shows the prevalence of violent acts for 100,000 of people in the countries mentioned. Um, England features um, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, tenth, tenth position, right? And that was in 1946, latest in 1946, because it, it came out in 1946 or 47, I guess, right? And homicide and suicide are obviously, uh, you know, uh, destructive acts, but there are other degrees of violence as well we need to think about, right? Um, 
Now, the one British playwright who uh, seems to have said or seems to have the have the right to say the last word on violence as far as men of theatre are concerned is Edward Bond, the person that I have worked on, that I, you know, I have researched on, uh, whom we quote here to see how he has assessed the causes of human violence. Fortunately, he writes, fortunately, the causes of human violence can be easily summed up. It occurs in situations of injustice. It is caused not only by physical threats, but even more significantly by threats to human dignity. There will always be minor human aggressions. You know, this is uh, this phrase or this section of this sentence is very, very, uh, you know, in interesting at the same time. You know, very beautiful, I would, I should say. Even in utopia, people will fall in love with the wrong person, forget gratitude, lose their temper. So at the very outset, we are trying to broaden the horizon of the definition of violence for that matter. In fact, there are so many things that can go wrong in this world, in our life, that violent reactions and aggressive impulses are sadly very, very common. But the text that I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, read with you people is also very common, and it's very difficult to, to, uh, to add anything new or anything extra to a, a text which is already pretty celebrated and has uh, got the cult status, right? Numerous books and hundreds of essays have already been written on Jimmy Porter's anger. Those of you, that is, my students who are already familiar with the text mm, must be knowing how 1956 there is one entire book given uh, to 1956 and all that that's the title uh, of the book by Dan Rebellato and you see how uh, interesting this entire event of look back in anger was I should say that it was more like a like a, a major event in the in the British theater history now there is almost nothing that is left to be discovered about Jimmy's important rage and the reasons behind it. And yet, several deliberations are still trying to get into the intricacies of the text and the character of this objectionable hero to understand the typical sociopolitical and economic uh, you know, fabric of the time in which Jimmy was living, becoming angry and violent. Freud writes in his civilization and its discontents, theaters captivate all the senses with their sensational productions, even the plastic arts turn by preference to the repulsive, the ugly and the exciting and do not hesitate to place before our eyes with revolting realism, the most hideous sights that reality has to offer. Uh, you know, I can, it seems it's more my area of interest, my area of, uh, you know, thesis or my research, you can say that it's violence. I have done my research on Edward Bond and uh, the, uh, I mean, the element of violence in his place. So you uh, understand that we can go on talking about this issue of violence. But then I must tell you that the intersection of violence and theatre is, is, is very interesting. We can really you know, uh, spend a lot of time discussing it, but that's not really the focus here. Anyways, but uh, what we are trying to suggest is that the theatre also uh, presents and or rather have, have a kind of a predilection for, uh, you know, presenting before us a kind of a spectacular presentation, something that is, it could be violent acts as well. Quoting Raymond Williams, um, you know, Catherine Jewart writes, to put ourselves and our situation on the stage is, as Raymond Williams puts it, a recurrent ambition of realism. In fact, the kitchen sink plays of the time introduced a fourth world realism with certain vehemence during that period. Both realism and naturalism in British theatre of the time constituted one of the two major strands then the other was the theatre of the absurd. Uh, Catherine Jewart further suggests that Arnold Wesker's drama is the most substantial in this convention. You know, she uh, uh, doesn't really consider John Osborne to be the one 
button to address the socio political issues uh, in in a kind of a, in a very straightforward manner unlike wesker obviously he does that is uh, osborn does but uh, not like wesker in that sense because you know um uh, wesker the way he was dedicated towards commitment literature which could be identified even in his conceptualization of the center 42 osborn was perhaps not in many of osborn's plays realism and symbolism combine in a rich texture and instead of a full blooded rebellion against the contemporary society or celebrating working class virtues and values which Wes wesker does osborn tries to explore the justness of anger or the merit of rage much of what happens in the play cannot be dubbed as violent because those of you who had read it who have read it already you know that not everything in the play can be called violent even where uh, jimmy is fulminating uh, you know is is angry anger is not necessarily violent there is a difference between the two the expression of anger is not necessarily violent right so much of uh, what happens in the play cannot be dubbed as violent, but uh, at the same time, while much can be. It is not a matter of perception or subjective interpretation that some would consider an action to be violent and others would not, but of understanding the rational behind that rage, which expresses through obvious instances of abuse and violence, and also to identify the different levels on which these are perpetrated. For reasons more than one, look back in anger is a cult text, right? A theatrical vault first of sorts, Osborne's play brought in a foul-mouthed working class protagonist as the hero of the play, while remaining largely loyal to the fourth world realism. That is what Osborne does. He gives us that is one of the reasons why Osborne's look back in anger is a cult text. There was uh, no such, you know, character like Jimmy Porter before him. So he gives us a character who is uncommon to speak the least, a declassy youth hailing from the working class background with a university degree. Jimmy is a misfit in the true sense of the term. Now, before Osborne, uh, the tradition of working class characters was not non-existent, right? To say, not uncommon. Tolstoy's uh, Power of Darkness, Hoffman's The Weavers, it's kind of giving you kind of an um, European uh, uh, perspective, right? Goldsworth's Strife and some capital and labor plays uh, and Edwardian new drama, they projected the working class picture. But 1956 saw a new kind of working class character whose unbridled energy gets transformed into an aggressive behavior that is compulsive and even neurotic. It is not surprising to think how the university educated Jimmy, isolating himself from his own class. That's why he is a dick class youth. He's neither here nor there, right? He's a working class person, but he has already got some uh, a university degree. But then again, he runs a sweet stall. And then again, he doesn't really want to mingle with the Sunday night tubes. I will be referring to it later. So it's very difficult to, to locate Jimmy Porter. And that's the, the problem that he himself, you know, kind of faces. It is not surprising to think how this university educated Jimmy isolating himself from his own class, running a sweet stall appears to be in so sense as far as the suffering of other characters around him are concerned. The uh, little physical labor he indulges in leads to his tremendous amount of energy getting channelized in abusing others. Bamber Gascoigne is the second quotation. Bamber Gascoigne feels the real reason for Jimmy's cruelty to his wife is his own excess of energy, which he cannot use in a sweet stall. You already know that 
you know, uh, a lot of emphasis is given to uh, physical activities when uh, an individual is passing through an adolescent period and later on when, uh, it's, uh, you know, if you're concerned with a young man, uh, the, young woman, one must engage in physical activities, otherwise the pent-up energy often be festers and becomes violent. And that is exactly, according to Bamber Gascoigne, uh, what is happening with Jimmy Porter. Jimmy is outraged by the hypocritical society he lives in. The politico-economical desperation that his country seems to be facing as a result of the loss of colonies and as an aftermath of the Second World War. And also the meaninglessness of relationships which do not offer an uh, emotional anchorage. People who are unable to share his anger are considered by him to be either pusillanimous, that is the adjective he uses for uh, Alison, that is pusillanimous like Alison, or his natural enemies like Helena, or Alison's family members, or an ignorant peasant like Cliff. There is not a single character who seems to have been, who seems to have not been on the receiving end of Jimmy's verbal tirades, right? Both Alison and Cliff witness and bear with Jimmy's physical violence too. Violence, for that matter, is a term that is often, you know, softened down, not literally, but tonally, when you use the term abuse, as if, as if, not really, as if abuse is not violence, you know, something perhaps a little less than that. Now, that's not really the case. So we can uh, use the term abuse, uh, terms abuse and violence interchangeably here, at least in the context of uh, look back in anger both verbal and physical or emotional and physical. That is, could be violence, could be abuse. Call it what you will. Its unpleasantness does not vanish in spite of this, of this naming game, you know. However, what we see in Jimmy is an aggression that is not merely an expression of his anger. His rage, rage-minded, is a passionate, disruptive and uh, even destructive emotion. But something more fundamental, his sense of discomfort, his desire, sense of insecurity. If you remember the very first, uh, you know, or, or at the very uh, beginning in the introduction, I say that insecurity is perhaps one of the biggest reasons of our becoming angry and violent. And uh, Jimmy is insecure, right? Um, in fact, violence is a complex response of man to something. The instinctivists um, see it as an instinctual response, something that human beings share with animals. And the behaviorists find in it a result of social conditioning. Uh, Jimmy's rage and violence is, of course, a perfect instance of behavioral quirks consequent upon social conditioning and ideological manipulation. However, there is more to it. The overall impression that I had after reading Look Back in Anger is that for the most part, it is Jimmy's loud, annoying and desperate attempts to assert his presence. It is a scream, loud and distinct. I uh, won't say that the comparison would be really something uh, worth pondering over. But whenever I, you know, I initially thought that I would include the uh, the picture that is the painting of Edward Moore that is scream in, in this, uh, you know, slideshow. But uh, then I uh, sort of uh, thought against it and dropped it, right? Uh, because, you know, that wouldn't have really made the comparisons very sound. But whenever I think of Jimmy, I also get to think of a screaming man. That, you know, some there are many critics who have uh, talked about Jimmy's orality, that is emphasis on his words, obscenities he uses, you know, the, uh, the verbal tirades, that is the verbal violence. I'll be referring to it gradually. Uh, I seem to think about, or I seem to, you know, or it, it, it keeps coming to me, that is the uh, um, wonderful painting by uh, Edward Munch, the expressionist painter, Scream. Many critics have found uh, Jimmy to be more of a victim than a victimizer. And there is sufficient reason behind a conjecture that projects Jimmy as a victim. 
beyond Jimmy's self-proclaimed status of a martyr of sorts. In fact, the angry young men movement had every reason to offer the political, economical, um, you know, uh, compromise consequent upon the transformation of the British Empire into Little England as an apologia, a justification for anger. However, anger does not necessarily result into violence or aggressive behavior, as I told you. It often festers within and transforms into rage, and then the passionate, uncontrolled outbursts would eventually take place. The pertinent question, therefore, is whether everything about Jimmy's rage and aggression is dated. The play begins with a description of the three characters on stage with Osborne's unequivocal comments to identify Jimmy as a disconcerting mixture of sincerity and cheerful malice, and very soon, Jimmy seemed to be lamenting the cultural impoverishment of uh, the English people and the newspaper's dependence on the French language. In his autobiography, Osborne explains, almost a gentleman, right, the literary and academic classes seemed to have been tyrannized by the French. The posh papers every Sunday blubbered with self-abasement in the face of the bombast of the French language and its absurd posture as the torchbearer of logic. Holding the same opinion, Jimmy starts his day by fulminating over this idiosyncratic cultural practice of his country, his own people. In the same breath, he assaults Cleave as an ignorant peasant. So at the same time, like it, these are, uh, you know, self-contradictory emotions and, and sort of, you know, he is uh, torn within, torn asunder. Jimmy uh, cannot really accept this uh, tyranny by the French language and culture. And on the other hand, mm, he says that, you know, he says to Cleave that you don't, you won't understand anything. You are an ignorant peasant, right? Uh, from there, he shifts to his usual target, Alison, whose unbearable silence over several issues that Jimmy finds difficult to cope with baffles him. In fact, Alison's passive aggressive behavior remains largely misunderstood as her acceptance of submissive, compliant victimhood. However, it is a terrible mistake to think of Jimmy as always the abusive, violent victimizer and Alison as the victim, because passive aggression is something which can be uh, considered as one specific form of aggression, right? So in that sense, Alison can also be considered to be aggressive in her own ways, right? Now, in fact, the play is on one level an intriguing instance of domestic violence, and its complex layers before entering into an analysis of the aspect. Let us look into the reasons behind Jimmy's rage here. A cultural bankruptcy along with the failure of the Labour Party to deliver something commensurate with its promises left a young man like Jimmy frustrated. And by bankruptcy, I do not mean mm, not having the requisite, but not understanding the potential. His rage seems legitimate when he encounters ethical hypocrisy. Reading from the newspaper, a section dealing with a girl's moral confusion, he's justly annoyed. The girl here wants to know whether her boyfriend will lose respect for her if she gives him what he asks for, stupid bitch. Now, showing you two you know, slides. This one is like, you know, uh, uh, the next two slides. That is this one and the next one, actually. They are had from this particular text, British Cultural Identities, edited by Mike Story and Peter Childs, right? And as you know, a sizable portion of Look Back in Anger, <coughs> sorry, deals with Jimmy's concerns with newspapers. He's largely critical of the cultural markers. And the papers, newspapers on the right, they are Jimmy's posh papers. And on the left, they are perhaps the weight papers or the ones which have a larger or you know bigger reach but they don't really contain the serious news to be precise and next slide again this one is also had from the same source that is the source british cultural identities 
edited by Mike Story and Peter Childs. The next one is uh, actually a snap from uh, one particular uh, newspaper's content. Jimmy is enraged by the moral vacuity reflected in such newspaper contents. You know, the typical agony on columns, like you um, try to share your worries and anxieties with uh, someone uh, who is coming up with certain suggestions and solutions. And Jimmy's sense of morality is quite free. He's a working class, liberal, young man in his 20s. Free sex doesn't really bother him, but he's aggressive to hypocrisy, right? Instead of ignoring, he justly feels morally responsible. And as a result, his inability to cope with this unpleasant reality makes his feeling of victimhood all the more conspicuous. Jimmy shuttles between two extremes. <clears throat> On one hand, he is angry and aggressive, asserting himself through violence. And on the other, he is the victim. Interestingly, both are expressions of violence. Technically speaking, a constant awareness of victimhood is considered to be an aspect of aggression as well. In fact, in the second act of the play, Helena ironically says to Jimmy, again, those who have gone through the text are already familiar with the lines. I haven't really, uh, you know, uh, quoted or rather I haven't really uh, written all the lines in the slides to show you, but then you are familiar with them. Um, or maybe when you will be reading the text, you will, you know, certainly find the resonance and you will be able to identify the lines that I'm referring to. So Helena ironically says to Jimmy, you think the world treated you pretty badly, don't you? To that, Alison adds that suffering is dear to Jimmy. His existence and his identity have always been closely connected with his sense of injury. This seems to be justified as there, uh, <clears throat> sorry, there is no denying the fact that his childhood experience of his father's suffering after his injury in the Second World War and the government's callousness in failing to protect the families of the people fighting and sacrificed for it marred Jimmy's childhood. Much of his aggressive responses to the people and the world around him stem from his anguish and frustration consequent upon his witnessing his father's slow and painful death and his mother's insensitive behavior towards his father. One may say that this is Jimmy's first major confrontation with his own death desire or thanatos. Thanatos is the term that Freud referred to as a death drive as posited against eros or life force. Uh, Freud does actually talk about this in his civilization and its dis discontents, where he uh, refers to Thanatos as a death drive, which is a powerful instinct, but so complex as to often elude detection. As the past left a strong and indelible imprint on his mind and makeup, his violent instinct eventually became obvious in his emotional imbalance, his raging passion, his anger. So no one of us would ever dare to think that, you know, Jimmy is a, an emotionally balanced human being, right? So never ever commit such a mistake because there is a, a lot of things. I mean, there are a whole lot of things going on in Jimmy's mind, which he cannot really, you know, sort of cope with. And that is where the problem lies. To this personal injury was added that social deprivation. As a result, his anger, which is not of necessity a violent emotion, waits for the cues and turns violent. Aggression, it has been observed, bolsters self-confidence. It is like an uncontrollable and overwhelming desire to harm others. This is also known as irritable aggression. When rage and aggression are directed towards an object, when the aggressor feels frustrated, hurt, deprived, and stressed. Since there is no good brave cause to die for anymore, that is exactly what Jimmy says, Jimmy's frustration relates to, with the loss of a secured past. It is not really difficult to trace the etiology of his anger, his frustration, 
And Dollard et al. explored the frustration that is in 1939, right? This uh, frustration aggression hypothesis or often called theory, which came out and Dollard, uh, the name of Dollard, John Dollard is associated with the hypothesis of the theory. There were others as well. Uh, they explored the frustration aggression connection model. In fact, frustration creates a readiness to respond in an aggressive manner to pick up the cue for aggression. Dollard mentions the occurrence of aggressive behavior always presupposes the existence of frustration and that the existence of frustration always leads to some form of aggression. So it's like a vicious cycle, right? So you are aggressive because of some frustration and then there you do something and then there is again frustration generated and it's uh, it goes on and on and on like that. And on the left, you see that I've written something, dollar projects frustration more as an event than as an affective state. More, most of us actually associate frustration with an affective state of mind. That is, we are frustrated. We are feeling bad. We are feeling down. We are feeling depressed and low because, you know, there's something that has happened and uh, uh, we are frustrated because of that. Dollar actually explained frustration as failure to get something. That means there is a kind of a hiatus. There is a kind of an obstacle on the way and you have failed to achieve something and that creates that frust frustration. It's more a kind of an event, frustration of a particular effort in that sense, right? So in Dollard's interpretation, it is actually an event rather than an affective state. That is, frustration is the inability to or failure in attaining a particular goal or an objective. Moreover, the frustration of an aggressive impulse breeds more frustration and aggression. The studies related to this hypothesis, as it is called, also proves that the aggressive response to frustration may not be gender specific. But gender is an important component in ascertaining the intensity of aggression as well as the target of aggressive behavior. Mind it. That is the. Ge I mean, gender is not directly associated with it, but both intensity and the identity of the target they depend on the gender uh, identity and gender construct. It has also been noticed that the violence is directed towards the possible source of frustration. In connection with the with the findings, Morland in 1949, that is almost ten years later, uh, said that you know this aggression instead of having, I mean, suggested that uh, this aggression instead of having a cathartic effect on the aggressor becomes a part of a vicious cycle. I told you that. As we learn gradually, it is his response to a structural violence per perpetrated on the working class. An obvious identification takes place between Jimmy and his father and Alison with his mother, Leonard Berkowitz later specifies that there is no need to overemphasize the link between frustration, anger, and violence, though the link is undeniable, right? It is undeniable, but there is no need to overemphasize it. Why? Because he seems to think, that is, Berkowitz seems to think that the violent or aggressive response is only present when there is a specific stimulus present. Um, one may say it is a matter of stimulus response, or it is a kind of stimulus response. For instance, the religious bigotry that Jimmy hates provokes him to rage and violent outbursts. From the newspaper, from Cliff, precisely, he gets to know the news of Bishop of Bromley's views against nuclear disarmament. There is an obvious link between violence of the kind one witnessed in the Second World War and religious bigotry. A veritable proof of that must have been Hitler himself in his destruction of the racial and the religious other. However, Jimmy does not only sarcastically put it, but brings out the violence embedded in it all. Did you read about the woman who went to the mass meeting of a certain American evangelist at Al's court? She went forward to declare herself for love or whatever it is. And in the rush of converts to get to the front, she broke four ribs and got kicked in the head. 
She was yelling her head off in agony. But with 50,000 people putting all they got into onward Christian soldiers, nobody knew she was there. Right. Jimmy is quite understandably outraged by this image of violence that becomes all the more glaring because of the obvious connection with religion. What Jimmy violently reacts against is itself violent. Ideological manipulation in whichever form it is done is aggressive and institutionalized religion like political bodies and dominant cultural practices are ideologically imposing and consequently violent. You know, uh, something that Bond uh, uh, talks about in great details in his own violence as well as uh, in the preface to Lear. Lear is one of the famous plays written by uh, Edward Bond, which is actually a reworking of uh, Shakespeare's King Lear, a kind of a, a you know recontextualization, rereading, right, of uh, the Lear myth, so to say. And uh, in the preface to that, he has uh, talked a lot about how morality is actually one form of aggression. We don't really consider morality or ethics or these issues to be violent or aggressive, but they are. You know, if you read Althusser's, uh, you know, uh, ideology or ideology and ideological state apparatuses, that is ISA, hmm, he talks about how these are also, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, violent in their ways. Not really the way we think about violence. It's not like uh, one killing another, one hurting physically another or verbally, right? I told you at the very beginning, you must broaden the definition of violence. You must think in a different ways, right? You must also learn to understand different dimensions of violence. All these my addresses are to my students, obviously not to my co colleagues, right? So it's um, because of that, you, you will gradually learn and understand that, you know, these ideological state apparatuses are basically violent. That is morality is violent, right? Now, the question about Jimmy's aggressive response is not whether it is justified or not. Violence can not be justified uh, always, right? There are some cases where, you know, Bond said that left-wing violence is justified because it is for the change of society. Anyways, but in the context of look back in anger, we cannot uh, say that for this type of violence is justified. There is no way we can justify uh, either physical or verbal violence. But rather its symptoms and its effects in the people around, that is something that we must study. Assess Assessing the ethical rectitude of the act of violence is almost redundant. Jimmy adheres to certain principles and dislikes hypocrisies inherent in some institutions and in the like manner, as Alison says to Helena, for Jimmy, allegiance matters more than loyalty. Be it Hugh, Cleef, or Alison, he's keen on enjoying their allegiance more than simple loyalty in relationships. As a result, Jimmy's reactions are of rage and violence when Helena convinces Alison to go to the church with her. Helena is seen as Alison's, um, you know, as uh, Alison's friend uh, and therefore one of uh, Jimmy's natural enemies. Not only is Jimmy hostile towards Helena and shades of all his fac facades of decency, if at any, any at all, he tries hard to assert his control by all possible means, to tell her about his experience of watching his father die. His tryst with his own Thanatos first, he tries to scare her with threats of physical assault. <clears throat> Helena, like eyes, if you come any nearer, I will slap your face. He looks down at her, a green smoldering, it's like an impish green, you know, smoldering round his mouth. I hope you won't make the mistake of thinking for one moment that I am a gentleman. I am not very likely to do that, Helena says. Bringing his face close to hers, have no public school scruples about hitting girls. Gently, if you slap my face, by God, I'll lay you out. Helena also mentions to Alison how she feels about the loud noise of Jimmy's jazz trumpet. <clears throat> It's almost as if he wanted to kill someone with it and me in particular. It's interesting to know how Jimmy can use a cultural 
expression, a musical instrument to convey his deep seated anger and an aggressive response. There may be one um, entire lecture given to the connection um, between a rage and jazz, but I'm not really the person to talk on it because I really don't have any, any knowledge for that matter. But I do know that there is this kind, kind of connection between the two. With Helena, of course, things are hostile for particular reasons. She walks in like an interloper, but stays there to replace Alison. She is a proto-feminist, yes, and has her way with him. It is Alison who is always on the receiving end of Jimmy's aggressive behavior, his actions and his words for a silence itself is a mark of passive aggression. However, the physical violence is also uh, it's also conspicuous to, right? For instance, in Act 1 itself, the mock fighting between Jimmy and Cleve is orchestrated in such a way that at one point of time, he pushes Cleve, you all know that, you know, he pushes Cleve onto Alison who burns her, he falls down and burns her hand on the heated iron. Alison gets hurt. And Jimmy soon confesses that he did it on purpose and we suspected as much. Even though Cliff gets kicked, insulted and bullied from time to time, it is Allison who is made to absorb Jimmy's cruelty. In fact, however much we try to approach the text from an angle in which we contextualize Jimmy's anger and frustration in the post-war uh, socio-political scenario in England, the register that we cannot and that we should not miss is of domestic violence. Look back in anger is as much about domestic violence as it is about 1956 and all that. Remember that. In a completely different context, both spatial and temporal and perhaps even ethical, a study referred to by John P. McKennedy in an article titled The Class Politics of Domestic Violence, that is the heading of this slide, you can see that. It is noted that women, as I told you, you know, just don't forget um, you know, the fact that it is also about domestic violence because we often keep celebrating Jimmy Porter because, you know, he is the product of the time, because he is more a victim than a victimizer, because of 1956 and all that. We tend to forget that this man also does something repulsive and disgusting, right? For whatever reason it is. And McKennedy uh, uh, writes, you know, it is noted that women whose social standing is higher than their partners may actually face greater risks of violence. This study was done in the perspective of Canada, probably, and it was done much later in 1989, 1990. But as I told you at the very beginning, violence is ubiquitous. It's present in varying degrees in all forms of society, human societies, and uh, that's what it is all about. You can see it in 1956, you can see it in 1989, now, and long back, maybe in the first century AD or BC, whatever. So, right. So, the hypothesis is that men with lower status than their wives may experience a threat to their control in their relationship and may resort to violent intimidation to re-establish their dominance. With Jimmy, the problem is obviously a lot more complex in the sense that Jimmy, being a university graduate, he is a unique case for studies. He has already isolated himself from his class, from the lumpen proletariat, so to say, the Sunday night yobs. You remember he says that, you know, he doesn't want to go to the movie theater uh, on Sundays because he doesn't uh, want to spoil his day um, with the Sunday night yobs. Right, And yet the working class virtues are dearly held by Jimmy. There is almost a total transformation of Jimmy's status. As a result, his abuses are mostly verbal. Call it Jimmy's orality or what you will, these verbal tirades are merely the marks of the fact Jimmy that Jimmy is only slightly evolved because of his education and whatever it is, right? Um... <clears throat> McKennedy further refers to several other findings and observations to show how demographic characteristics of domestic violence mostly suggest that violence is likely to be connected with low income or financially 
uh, compromised working class men, even when arguments have tried to project domestic violence as largely classless. More effective studies are required, perhaps, in the sphere to lay bare the certain, so to say, classlessness we link with domestic violence. It isn't, perhaps. With the constant bickering over issues, dire economic situation, and an acute sense of conjugal muddle, Jimmy and Allison are not in a position to welcome a baby or to think of a family. However, Jimmy is not even informed about Jim Allison's pregnancy. To us and to Cliff, the news comes as a shocking surprise immediately after Jimmy's violent gesture has led to Allison getting hurt. Allison is apprehensive of Jimmy's responses to the news, and she seems to have decided to keep it a secret as a result. In fact, given the insensitivity of Jimmy, the decision appears to be a wise one. By the end of the act, Alison reports about Helena's phone call and her intention to come uh, and stay for a while. Jimmy has already rummaged through her handbag to discover whether there is something of him, some hints that he's being betrayed and it tells us how living together with another person day in and day out has made him suspicious and predatory. And he shows a reflection of his predatory nature as soon as Alison lets him know about Helena. Oh, my dear wife, you have got so much to learn. I only hope uh, you learn it one day. If only something, something would happen to you and wake you out of your beauty sleep, coming in close to her. If you could have a child and it would die. Just imagine the situation when we already have come to know that Alison is pregnant. You know, the sheer horror of this, uh, of this scene is uh, almost spine chilling because here, you know, Jimmy is Excuse me, Jim is coming close to Alison and saying something which is nerve wracking, given the fact that Alison is already going to have a child, going to have a you know baby. So it's it's uh, disgusting, but there is something else in it. You know, uh, you see the heading of the slide: diabolical or, or diabolonian ethics. I will uh, you know refer to it very soon. There is nothing more brutal or sinister sounding, sinister sounding in the play than this one, perhaps. Almost 10 years later, when that is in 1965, when Edward Bond depicted an infanticide on the stage, the British audience was outraged. It created such a furore in the British theatre scene that very soon the theatre censorship machinery was done away with for good. But the whole thing put the readers and the audience in a quandary regarding the questions of ethics and aesthetics all over again. Uh, Jimmy and Alison are not Pam and Fred or Pam and Lynn. Let me just, uh, you know, tell you, uh, you know, in, in one line or maybe in a couple of lines what happens there that is so nerve-wracking, that is so disturbing that we keep referring to it. You know, Edward Bond depicts a murdering of a, of a murder of a child or a baby in its pram by its own biological father and his friends. You know, that is Fred, biological father uh, of the baby is Fred, and its mother is Pam, who eventually leaves the Pam, I mean, sorry, leaves the pram, that is Pam leaves the pram in the uh, park, and the baby is there unattended, and eventually it gets killed by Fred and his friends. So that's what uh, Edward Bond calls, that is what he calls or identifies as diabolonian ethics. And I told you, Alison and Jimmy are not Pam and Fred or Pam and Lynn. They are, these people are educated and Alison belongs to a, a higher class that is in uh, upper middle class society. In no way can we find an exact parallel between the two situations, but there is a parallel that is, uh, you know, the seems to be an underlying truth in Look Back in Anger as well. Jimmy is educated and his status, though not his class, is much different from the one that Fred, Lane or their friends belong to. 
and the characteristic working class violence is also modified in Jimmy's case. And yet the hint of the death of the child in Jimmy's wishing death for his own child invariably reminds us of the trope of Kindermod, Kindermod killing of the child in this connection. Pam and Fred were socially, economically and psychologically unable to take care of the baby. And the baby battering episode becomes a symbolic representation of a socioeconomic crisis which remains central to Bond's dramatic aesthetics. Osborne does not take violence onto the center stage of his plays. Look back in anger is an exception. However, even then, the play has a lot more instances of verbal violence than the physical ones. Before going uh, further, I mean, going on and to the next slide, let me just tell you that I have written something here, Diabolonian Ethics. The expression was in use for quite some time. Uh, you know, Bond was inspired by this, and this happens to be there in Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. There is one, there are a couple of lines, actually, um, you know, uh, at the end, or no, at the very beginning, actually, there's Proverbs of Hell, and uh, there, towards the end of this first verse, we have this, sooner murder an infant in its cradle, the nurse unacted desire. Sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desire. And that is exactly what is considered to be the Diabolonian ethics, which inspired Edward Bond as well. Not that Jimmy is, uh, you know, thinking in the same line, but the way he wishes... Uh, Ellison to lose his child or child's uh, death, it's something nerve wracking and scandalous. We move on to the next slide, as I told you, that there is not only physical violence, but uh, verbal violence. And it, uh, obviously, it's, it's more in quantity. The instances are there. Violence has to be un understood in terms of verbal violence as well. Aggression is not restricted to physically hurting someone. Rather, it should include emotional or psychological violence in contrast. Verbal violence plays an instrumental role in psychological abuses. In fact, verbal violence, like physical violence, is divided into four categories according to the model provided by Barron in 1977. And he did it uh, based on Bus, who provided the model in 1971. That is verbal active direct, verbal active indirect, verbal passive direct, and verbal passive indirect. These are the four different forms of verbal violence. In Jimmy, we see the predominance of the first kind. You can easily identify Jimmy's verbal violence as verbal active direct violence. As he insults and emotionally injures Alison almost every now and then. However, Alison herself may be blamed, as I have already mentioned in passing, for both verbal passive direct and indirect violence. As Jimmy claimed that she twist one's arms with her silence. Her constant denial of verbal communication with Jimmy or her decision to not actively defending him or his ideas in public can be interpreted by Jimmy as violent. However, Jimmy's orality overwhelms all others' reactions, violent or not. He uses obscenities, blames her family, calls and names, he uses foul words to describe her mother. The list is long. Similar insults are ripped upon Cleef as well from time to time. Mac Kennedy records the comment made by Lupri on the findings related to verbal aggression and emotional heart. The finding points to the importance of incorporating emotional abuse into our definition of violence, restricting the, vi sorry, the definition of violence to physical assault only tends to overrepresent men of lower socioeconomic status and to underrepresent men of higher status, status, not class minded, and thus introduces a serious class bias. Second, this finding underscores an argument made earlier emotional violence is another form of victimization that should not be ignored. 
with a persistent verbal attack against Alison, Jimmy uh, wields a certain control over Alison's life. Consequently, in the fear of an aggressive response, she's barely keeping in touch with her family and friends, and that too surreptitiously. Moreover, all of Jimmy's references to Alison and her family conjure up an image of a battle of some sort. That is exactly what the responses of the readers are to the semiotic suggestions of the words and expressions used in this connection. For instance, when Alison describes to Helena about how Jimmy and Hugh treated her, she uses words to reveal the underlying sense of battle involved. Together, they were frightening. They both came to regard me as a sort of hostage from those sections of society they had declared war on. Or, it was just an enemy territory to them, and as I say, they used me as a hostage. About Hugh, he says, Hugh fairly reveled in the role of the barbarian invader. Thus, through Alison, we are introduced to the performative angle of Jimmy's aggression, words which perform, and acts which represent. Violence thus depends on its performance as well. His abusive words also betray a deep-seated misogyny. When he describes Alison's lovemaking, <clears throat> and the way she moves, he is downright humiliating. The way she jumps on the bed as if she was stamping on someone's face in that casually destructive ways of hers, it's someone launching a battle battleship. So repeatedly uh, do we find that this particular suggestion of battle or war is, you know, sort of, you know, uh, coming up. He uses the same dismissive expressions full of disgust when he describes the two other female tenants once they were. These are not Jimmy's expressions of rage, but his deep-rooted sense of deprivation and frustration, which takes the form of anger, and anger is nothing more than an attempt to make someone feel guilty, often. According to Michelin Wonder, Jimmy's political rage is displaced. Firstly, his energies are expended totally on interpersonal relationships, and secondly, his sense of class hatred is sublimated into sexual hatred and attacks on women in general. Jimmy's rage and violence are an expression of both societal conflicts and personal despondency born of a sense of frustration. Alison is targeted always because she is, as Bach and Wyden suggest, Jimmy's intimate enemy. He sees the strife between them perhaps as fair fighting. And that is where the problem lies. Because he seems to make the effect of his aggressive behavior light and insignificant. In a toxic relationship for Alison and Jimmy, perhaps for Alison and Jimmy, perhaps it is actually a toxic relationship for Alison and Jimmy, perhaps epitomizes that form of masculinity, which is a curious product of patriarchy, is not insensitive, but enjoys an amount of agency for aggressive responses. The theories of aggression and anger would also perhaps bring a biological, physiological angle to it, which is another probability. The abundance of a neurotransmitter like serotonin is responsible for an aggressive behavior in man, it is said. And it is seen that angry and volatile people have high testosterone level and high metabolic rate. Jimmy's lanky body, that is, is very slim, and his claim that men like him never get fat because they burn everything up is a veritable proof of the fact that Jimmy's anger and aggression are perhaps rationally well-founded. But more than anything else, we can feel that a sense of injured merit and deprivation turns rancid in himself, in Jimmy. He himself comes to the receiving end of a class-based structural violence. And violence of poverty, that is. Throughout his life, he has been encountering that only. J. Allen, in 2001, floats the idea of structural violence based on class distinction. 
Nora Hosken in her article on structural violence quotes from Ellen to show how structural violence recognizes the capacity of people and institutions to inflict harms such as discrimination, inequalities, social injustice, and so on. All these are so attuned as to limit people's cultural, emotional, and intellectual growth. As Berkowitz claims, people become angry and aggressive on being kept from reaching a desired goal to the extent that they think that someone had intentionally and unfairly prevented, prevented them. With this constant sense of unease, Betrayal and deprivation, Jimmy is trapped inside a sort of menagerie within himself. That's it. And you can see Richard Barton and Mary Ur as Jimmy and Alison, respectively. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Umshumanda. So uh, we'll just see the chat box if there are, there is anything that uh, has come up. Yes, Indrani, you have written something that I can uh, read. No, this actually, is something that I was uh, just telling my students actually because uh, you know I just wanted them to kind of follow up. Chomba yeah. Koshal says that all the characters belong to the no man's land. They are all fence sitters. Only attitudes are different. So, your comment. It's on a really brilliant observation, Chompadi. I was actually, you know, however much we try uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to say or to suggest that, you know, Jimmy is one big rebel, but he is not. And if you remember, uh, at the very beginning, I, I actually uh, referred to Catherine J. Ward's observation regarding Wesker and Osborne. She makes this uh, very interesting difference. And uh, she says that Wesker represents the tradition uh, of commitment to literature much more acutely than Osborne. Perhaps even in Osborne's own life, um, there is this problem. There is this, uh, you know, kind of confusion and... Uh, Jimmy is actually a, a fence sitter in a way, Cliff is, Alison definitely is because it is, I mean, that is what uh, Cornel Redfern actually says about uh, his own daughter. But Jimmy also is a kind of a fence sitter because he practically doesn't achieve anything with the help of his rage or anger. It is an important rage. And does he really want things to change? And that is the big question. And Champadi, thank you for this observation. Yes, to a great extent, it is true. Uh, Rhea Banerjee says, Sir, does Alison's silence carry a potentially violent streak to it? Yes, that is exactly what I have also referred to. Uh, whether you have missed it or not, it's actually a passive aggressive behavior. And uh, even in case of verbal violence, when I say that there are four different kinds of verbal violence, one is that passive indirect uh, you know, that is exactly what uh, Alison is doing, that she's, kept, you know, she's silent and she's not really responding to what Jimmy has to say. And uh, that actually sends uh, Jimmy uh, to uh, furious reactions afterwards. So and even Jimmy says that that woman there, that girl there standing there, she can twist your arms with a silence. So obviously there is a streak of violence in uh, Alison's silence. And it's not just about Jimmy. The play has very, uh, you know, it's layered and it's interesting in that sense. Antura has written something it's pretty Antura long. Has Let me just. Thank you. I can't see. Uh, yes, I'll go down. Uh, Antura Mukherjee. Oh, uh, there are other, other questions written, and observations. Uh, sir, could you explain Diabolinian ethics once more? I didn't understand. Yes. Uh, yes, Diabolonian ethics is like, you know, Blake in the marriage of heaven and hell has written these wonderful two lines. You know, Blake was quite a rebel in his own right. And it was very difficult to contain a Blake, uh, so to say, because, you know, that's why many people um, 
considered Blake to be a mad genius because if you call someone mad, then you practically don't have the responsibility of listening to him, uh, you know, precisely or or attentively. As if madman speaking, so why pay attention to the blabbering of the madman? And you know, uh, Blake was often considered to be a madman because from the very early childhood days, he saw angels sitting on trees or on the on the roadside. So he had these visions, mystical visions. Whatever it is, at the very beginning of the marriage of heaven and hell, he has written something that is very interesting, these two lines. Sooner mother and infant in its cradle than uh, nurse unacted desire. So there is almost a kind of a suggestion it, these lines are rather provocative. You know, sooner mother and infant in its cradle than nurse and unacted desire. I referred to Edward Bond's Saved, where Pam and Fred, they remain unmarried. They are not really responsible enough to nurture their baby, right? The baby is born and the baby is left on the park in a pram by Pam, that is its mother. And later on, Fred, its own father and his friends, they come and kill the baby, right? That uh, that created such a big furor in, in uh, the theater, uh, British theater scene. So this is actually, uh, you know, Bond was talking about, about and referring to as Diabolonian ethics that was sort of propagated by uh, Blake in his The Barrage of Heaven and Hell, sooner mother and infant in its cradle than a nurse and unacted desire. Osborne's Jimmy Porter really doesn't go to that extent because he's quite uh, an educated man. Um, the polish is uh, superficial. It, it wears off very soon. And the real Jimmy Porter uh, is just a little bit evolved, uh, you know, uh, a little more evolved than the Sunday night he obviously he seems to hate. He doesn't uh, do that, like he doesn't kill his uh, child in, in any sense, but he wishes Alison to lose her child, that is Jimmy's own child as well. You can understand that that's what, uh, that's why this uh, comparison is being brought in, right? Thank you. Antora uh, questions, um, uh, comments, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 as well let as me questions. Just that yeah, let me just yes, read, read it all. Uh, yes. uh, it's, it's pretty big actually, yes, yes. for the observation. In an interview published 19th January 2019, the last surviving member of the cast of movie looked back in anger. Gary Raymond's opined, to be honest, uh, I found him really irritating. I just wished it shut up. I think a lot of people feel that way, but you couldn't say it at the time. Do you think that the inefficacy of Jimmy's rage has anything to do with the temporality of the place uh, staging or its uh, filming in um, 1959? Uh, partly true because you know it it was staged in staged in 1956 and filmed in 1959. The director is the same. Uh, if you know on on obviously you know that Tony Richardson. But then the the thing is. Um, Yes, to a certain extent, there were certain problems, you know. Um, let me just uh, refer to certain certain things. Uh, there were certain intellectual uh, responsibilities. There was already SCGB, that is Arts Council of Great Britain. Then there was uh, the CPGB, that is Communist Party of Great Britain. You can understand that all these institutes, all these associations or whatever they are, they have their own claims on the writers. And Royal Court Theatre was, as Antara, you must be knowing, uh, was uh, you know, sort of you know, honing and cultivating the, the young talents, the budding talents. So this was a Royal Court Theatre performance. That is the first 1956 performance stage presentation was the Royal Court Theatre presentation. Um, to a certain extent, it's true that, uh, you know, these uh, playwrights were trying to say something new, but at the same time, there were problems. Like, uh, the problem was not only the problem of the playwrights, perhaps, but also of the royal court, um, to a certain extent. You know, how much to approve, because the theatre censorship was still pretty active and uh, functioning. Uh, that went away with uh, uh, Bond's saved and, you, you know, Bond actually rescued uh, British theatre from theatre censorship and the uh, kind of uh, machinery it was. But yes, to a certain extent, it is. 
And oh, you have said something else. My reference is also to Alan Silito's observation within three years. John Osborne didn't contribute to the British theatre. He sets up a landmine called Look Back in Anger and blew most of it up. Yes, it was like 1956 and all that. You know, the, the big landmine, it was there and um, everything changed, right? So he's... And uh, Catherine G. Words comments at the very beginning, which I refer to, you know, I cannot go on talking about all these things because it was primarily aimed at, uh, you know, students. Uh, I could have also talked about the realistic uh, theatre or theatre of uh, realism, naturalism and Osborne's place in it and uh, how Osborne uh, sort of contributed to it or not, right? But as I told you, uh, you know, Wesker and Osborne, uh, and there is a difference between the two. In that sense, uh, Osborne's uh, look back in anger has a cult status, but Webb's, Webb, sorry, Wesker's chips with everything, uh, roots or chicken soup with barley, uh, these uh, plays, they don't really have that kind of status, right? Uh, like look back in anger, but they uh, address the problems, socio-political, economic, whatever, um, much more directly. And even Whiskers' involvement in Centre 42 is something that we don't see in Osborne. Osborne, uh, in that sense, as Tom also said, was sort of a fan sitter, but then uh, the kind of effect that Look Back in Anger had was phenomenal. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Divyangana. Oh, Edward. Sir, you referred yes, to right. Edward I have, I actually decided to include it first and then I, I, I made it uh, uh, a part of my, um, you know, uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentation. But then I thought that if I, I did that, I, I should be doing it or uh, if I had done that, I should have done it with certain conviction. Uh, but I was not getting enough support for my own argument that I was actually going to uh, sort of put forth. But uh, this is more like, you know, whatever is happening over here, that is, I was thinking or what I was feeling. Edward Munch's expressionist painting, Scream, is, as you know, is a wonderful thing. And uh, uh, the Scream was actually, it, it, there, are, there are several things that probably Monk was actually referring to. Uh, the pig slaughterhouse, which was there, the squilling pigs that he heard, then the noise coming from the mental asylum because Monk himself was, uh, you know, he was uh, suffering from time to time from bouts of depression and mental problems. His own sister was there in mental asylum for some time. And you can understand that it is like, you know, it was a constant thing on him, an impression. And that scream, the presentation was like, as many people have said, that it is not just about this agony. It is a violent picture, right? Because the lines are smudged and the lines go like that. If you if you see, I mean, if you know what I mean. And um, uh, the first thing that I noticed about uh, Monk's uh, picture or painting is perhaps the, the mouth. That is the screaming mouth. And uh, I failed that look back in anger to a great extent is what Jimmy is in. It. Jimmy is trying to be heard and he's trying too hard for that matter to be heard. Right. So he's screaming at the top of his voice often, often with the help of this, uh, you know, jazz trumpet. So there is a lot of noise, which is not just about his depression, anxiety, rage and violence. But all, I mean, not just rage, but also about violence. So that's what uh, I thought, but then I decided against it. I did not really include it uh, because I thought that there should be a robust critical support uh, to support this or solid support in order to support my argument. But then uh, if I can, I will perhaps think about it anyways. And if you people also can think about connection, you can do it on your own because you, 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 are, you are good, right? So the next one. Dulal Shorkar, explain the psychological, sociological value of look back in anger. Oh my God, this is, <laughs> Indrani, this requires another <laughs> lecture. Psychological and sociological value of look back in anger is like, you know, if you look at the, look at the characters of uh, Jimmy Porter, Alison, Helena, they are not uh, monodimensional. Right, they are obviously, um, you know, multi-dimensional characters. 
they change their dynamic characters right so whatever is happening in look back in anger is not also happening on one single plane that is whatever you are seeing right as i said that uh, many of osborne's plays actually are a uh, symbol i mean the he actually uh, fuses symbolism and realism to a great extent and and you know that there are lots and lots of symbols in in look back in anger the uh, animal images or symbols a bear and squirrel game then the iron and so on and so forth uh, jimmy's shirt that has been worn by worn by alison and then by helena so it goes on so this this is not happening on one plane right it is happening on the psychological plane as well how the characters are behaving responding reacting to the immediate surrounding and to the you know the bigger perspective their micro time and the macro time so all these things are i mean if you read obviously i don't know whether you are a student or you are uh, one of my colleagues or uh, i don't really know your identity so i i uh, just keep it open ended that when you read the text you can understand that there are so many different levels on which these characters actually are responding and sociological value it is kind of look back in anger has a tale tale effect after all because 1956 as uh, antara you know wrote um, or actually shared uh, this observation with us and it brought in a kind of a sea change not only uh, it was uh, referring to the contemporary practices the condition of england um, you know the swiss crisis the problems of nuclear disarmament i mean the the question of nuclear disarmament and there are so many other issues sociological issues that jimmy eventually refers to that we often feel that 19th i mean look back look back in anger is perhaps dated because it is there in 1956 and it is concerned with the contemporary sociological economic political issues right uh yeah that's it uh divyangana says sir i saw another picture from mother courage where helene uh, weigel was screaming and that was a silent scream is there any connection uh, uh yeah that can be uh, i i i um don't know which picture you were uh, referring to actually but then uh, silent scream is actually what edward monk is also uh, monk's scream is also referring to yeah but then in case of jimmy porter you can understand that it is uh, not a silent scream it's it's noisy rather that noise is kind of you know deafening and that is what where the difference lies mother courage yes mother courage is a very wonderful christian play um again this has this, uh, has its bearing on one of edward bond's uh, plays i feel tempted to talk about but no not of that anymore <laughs> uh umshumanda i like uh, mm. so uh, like you know i was just thinking that uh, mm. so uh, jimmy and i was somehow you know that the fact that does he actually want to change so you had given you know you were saying that oh, the anger time mean, does he really want to change something so uh, am i'm tempted yeah, to draw is, a comparison in, mm. with hamlet but uh, of course It, mm, i mean the mm. play is dated so uh, would there be at all any comparison with the hamlet syndrome yes of course there is a comparison uh, on on several different levels perhaps because you know jimmy jimmy um is jimmy's equation with women first of all is kind of uh, strained and it's very very peculiar to be precise because he he uh, you know fell in love with madeline and there is almost a kind of a uh orestian dilemma also because he could not really tolerate his own mother on the other hand he could not to- tolerate alison's mother but he obviously almost like revered hugh's mother and then he fell in love with medlin who was all those years uh, older to him so it's very curious and uh, can kind of confusing as well but it's a fact that jimmy often wanted women to be uh, to 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 have a control on his life as well it's very it's a very curious observation but it's a fact that jimmy can never uh, do without women right and as you have said that and at the same time he's a misogynist yes yes he's at a misogynist and at the same time that's that's where the problem lies that's where the uh, you know that's where uh, jimmy is so confusing for many of us hmm. and with hamlet obviously there is this connection perhaps that uh, Hamlet also has this typical Orestian dilemma 
right? Um, you know, his mother uh, married his uncle and killed uh, his father. So uh, against Gertrude, he was his mind was poisoned from the very beginning. And on the other hand, Hamlet also is uh, sort of, you know, as I say that Jimmy is confusing, so is Hamlet. And probably because of that reason, we can find this kind of comparison because he also doesn't really want to change. And, uh, you know, Chompadi's observation at the very beginning was really startling because, yes, to a great extent, Jimmy also does not want to change. Jimmy is also kind of, Jimmy is not a fence sitter in that sense as, uh, you know, as Alison is, because Alison doesn't really come up with any particular uh, voice or, or any particular observation. She doesn't really have a voice. She doesn't really have a particular uh, observation. Jimmy has. Jimmy uh, comes up with his ideas and, and views and everything, but that he doesn't really want to change. You know, uh, a one-man army and also really doesn't uh, do much in order to change the immediate society proves that he really doesn't want to change. And as we all know that the end of look back in anger is perhaps not really an end. It's kind of an open-ended thing because who knows that the, uh, you know, the entire thing will be repeated. It's almost menacing the way, uh, you know, Jimmy and Alison come uh, close to one another and decide to lead a better life is something that fails to convince many of us. Yes. Right. So uh, I can't see further <laughs> questions, but that was a very riveting interactive session, I would say. Quite went mm. on for quite some time. So this Thank only you. kind of shows that how, um, you know, uh, deep at the same time, very informative your paper was. So uh, Thank we, you, we, we kind of look forward to further interaction with you later when the old normal returns. We hope yeah. we would want yeah. better interaction. Uh, more, I mean, physical, I mean, where you could come over yeah. or we could go over and we could have a better form of interaction. So thank you very much. Thank you for making me a part of this. I enjoy thoroughly and the questions also. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Umshuman Mukhopadhyay and our, my colleagues and my dear students for uh, taking out time and being a part of this uh, special lecture series. Uh, Shall we end the meeting now? So, Shumanda, we would end yeah. the meeting now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.